on Listen Up, are we living in a material world? Exploring ideas in the movement to curb consumerism. Today on Listen Up. Hello and welcome to Listen Up, I'm Lorna Duick. Well, it's the Christmas season and every year questions surface like, is it a Christmas tree or a holiday tree? Should we buy gifts or should we buy a goat for a family in the third world? Well, we say yes to all of the above. It is a Christmas tree. Gifts do show our love and we should spread it all around. But this year, we take a look at how it can be done a little differently. First, do we really need all the stuff we think we do? Do advertisers lead us to believe we just can't live without the next big thing? At Buster's Media Foundation is an organization running a campaign called Buy Nothing Day. Started in British Columbia and it has spread right around the world. Recently a group of protesters were given permission to perform outside one of Canada's icons of consumerism, the Toronto Eaton Centre. Christmas shopping, my true love bought for me some gasoline for my, my Humvee. <laughs> that was Michael Johnson, actor, activist, and musician performing with his troupe for Buy Nothing Day, an event now celebrated in 65 countries around the world. Adbusters.org and Buy Nothing Day events ask consumers the questions, do you really need it? Who made it? And where does it come from? Here's a look at one of Adbuster's controversial commercials. Recently shown on CNN, but organizers say they haven't been allowed to buy time on the other major networks. The average North American consumes five times more than a Mexican, 10 times more than a Chinese person, and 30 times more than a person from India. We are the most voracious consumers in the world. A world that could die because of the way we North Americans live. Give it a rest. November 26 is Buy Nothing Day. When we return, perhaps throwing out the baby with the bathwater isn't the only answer. How about buying gifts that are known as fairly traded around the world? 10,000 Villages, a retail chain with unique buying power, right after this break. Welcome back. We're talking about everything from consumerism to a new movement underway to stop people from crowding malls, maxing out the credit cards, or even buying online. Today at Listen Up, we're questioning consumerism. We recently joined with one of our partners, Salt and Light Television, to interview people with very different approaches to shopping and buying gifts. Ingrid Heinrich Pauls from 10,000 Villages. Thanks for coming. Thanks, my pleasure. Okay, you have a way to make my spending for gifts much more meaningful. Why is this a better way to shop at 10,000 Villages? Because 10,000 Villages is fair trade. Fair trade opposed to conventional trade where the, uh, the whole point in conventional trade is making a profit. Buy low, sell high, and no one really pays attention to what happens to the producers. With fair trade, it starts with the producers. We at 10,000 Villages sell from about 35 developing countries, 120 or so artisan groups, 70% about our women. We pay them first. We pay them half up front of a price that they and we decide together. This is a fair price. We pay them half up front, the other half when it's ready to be delivered. So by the time it gets here, they've already been paid a fair wage. So everything you purchase makes a real positive difference. And you work with them to say, here's products that would work in Earth. Tell me what you, what you, what you can all buy at oh, 10,000 Villages. Oh, it's so villages. hard to decide what to bring. <laughs> okay. We have the most wonderful things. Well, I'm going to start with coffee and chocolate. Okay. Those are the most exploited crops in the world, and we take them so for granted. What do you mean, exploited? I know coffee, but chocolate? Chocolate, chocolate. too. A lot of child labor in chocolate. It's very good for us, but kids in Africa are carrying, working with big machetes, carrying heavy uh, weights and using pesticides. How frequent is child exploitation in our Christmas chocolate? Well, apparently about 70% of the 
chocolate that comes from Africa is involves child labor. I wouldn't even know if my chocolate no, does come from Africa. There is a logo. It doesn't matter if ours comes from Africa too. A lot of it, but there's a logo on it saying that's fair trade, and then you know. So then there, those families are actually getting. A, a, a better price than they would if they would take it to the regular. Exactly, yes, and premiums and with all our different artisan groups around the world they're not only getting a fair wage but they're getting education, they're getting health benefits, they're, they're part of the co-op that they work with. We deal directly with the groups not with the middlemen. Okay, so it's a few other products a here. Uh, that's a, a if you like here. someone who likes something hot, that's from Swaziland. We sell jams and chutneys from there, but that is the hottest stuff, and people love it. It has flavor, too. Okay. Here's a wonderful nativity from Laos. I got to go to Laos and Philippines this year to meet our producers, and this really helps people who live in very primitive fashion. Everything is meant so that they'll have enough income to put a roof over their heads, which is a literal thing, a roof over their heads that's not straw straw lets, uh, rots too quickly, um, enough to send their kids to school. In many of these countries, like in the Philippines, where this beautiful capiz shell angel comes from, schooling is free, but transportation, uniforms, books isn't free. So are all of these handmade by yes. really, like this is not a mass factory producing That's this? That's right. So I am really connecting with, if I buy this lovely nativity set yes, in look this hands, that's like... Yes, they, what they would use is a little a little mold that they use for that, but everything is hand painted. And they have to improvise with the paintbrushes, cat hair, children's hair, and a big paintbrush, you know, big wow. pen thing. And that's the family's job. That's right. That supports the whole family. Yeah. What kind of prices am I looking at? Is it going to cost more to buy directly from the producer like this? No, because we use so much volunteer staff. Wow. People are forever commenting on how reasonable our prices are. Now you can get, you know, this is a $185 angel from Mexico. Okay. Made of recycled tin. Takes a lot of work. So we also have pricier items, but good quality, uh, interesting, unique, and really is great. There's a family that works on this. Look, I'd like you to look at this little egg here. Do you see this egg mm -hmm. from Peru? Mm -hmm. That is a real egg. It started with a small group, eight families, and um, they... Uh, the woman decided that she could make this little scene in an egg. So she goes, mm -hmm. the one woman goes to the bakery every morning at four to break the eggs for them because they need the inside, she needs the outside. So she has to carefully break them, and I've tried it, it's not easy. Then of course they have to be cleaned, painted, lacquered, dried, the little characters made, painted, glued in, the outside painted. It's twelve dollars and it's beautiful. Isn't that something? And how do you find these people? Most of our uh, connections are through Mennonite Central Committee country workers. Mennonite Central Committee is our parent country, parent company. And, uh, so as charities, you've made a partnership and say, yes. you find the people, we'll come in and do the shopping. Very often, not always. And it's really an active look for a really poor group, like a group that really needs help. So they haven't got another alternative. They're not successfully producing That's something right. already. You're working on some things that are um, even, th what's this, by the way? This is like a recycled. Oh, I met those people this summer. That's, a re that's made out of newspaper. We also have earrings and these hot mats. So they buy the newspaper that hasn't okay. been sold. Uh, coil it. It's a long, hard on the hands process, but these women make 50% of their family income from that. Uh, they were so excited that we're buying it. I wore my earrings this summer for a week on vacation, swimming in the okay. shower, everything. They're tough. It, recycled paper. Yes, they, they dip they it in were, starch after. It's they, very tough. Uh, you're wearing, uh, I think, Ooh, free trade, one of my you? Fair trade. Oh, fair trade. Yes. No, free, very different, yes. right? Yes. Oh, I love that. This is Marketplace, and it's all reversible. Wow. And this is okay. a group from India also, and it's a, just a make-work project for women. And how much is a, a garment like that? I think this is about 135 and they're all... Um, uh, applique and embroidered so another woman has work and they're fully reversible. It's a really great organization. Hair products, face products, it's, it goes yes. really broad, doesn't oh, we, it? When people Laptop call and cases. Say, what do you sell? I said everything but hardware. Wow. You know, we sell it all. Joining us is Sharon Naipaul, someone else who got fed up with just how much Christmas can cost. Sharon, thank you for joining us here. Mm -hmm. And uh, what ticked you guys off that you said enough is enough? Um, well, it started with not being able to afford gifts. Uh, a couple of Christmases ago, we basically, we had no choice. We had to say to our families, we can't buy gifts this year. And what that did was it gave us enough uh, space to be able to look at, the, look at it a little more uh, 
uh, with a little more perspective. So last Christmas, uh, we were able to afford gifts, um, but by that time, I uh, began working at the Evergreen Center for Street Youth, part of Yang Street Mission. Um, so I, we had two things happening. We could afford the gifts, um, but now I'm working with these people, these wonderful young people who have nothing but the clothes on their back. And I'm saying something doesn't add up here. Um, and I needed to, what we decided to do was support other people who don't have the basic necessities instead of buying things for people who already have everything that they need. How do you explain this to a little child? And nephews. Right. They're getting nothing from you except. Right. right. How do you explain that? That's very interesting, actually. I actually did have a conversation with my niece and nephew, my sister's children. Uh, my nephew's 11, my niece is 6. And I thought, you know what? It's never too early to start teaching them about giving. And I said, you know, I kind of want to talk to you guys about Christmas. So I said, you know, you know how you guys kind of have everything you already want. You know, you've got your PlayStation, you know, you've got your this and that and the other thing. So I said, you know, I was wondering it, what you guys thought about this Christmas, about possibly instead of buying gifts for you guys, if together we decided on something we could contribute towards and buy something for somebody else that they really need. I said, so, you know, for example, and my nephew just didn't even let me finish. He said, oh, Auntie, I've heard all about that before. He's like, I want to buy the medical kits. And you could have just knocked me over with a feather. I had no idea that their awareness was that high. I was so proud of them at that moment. But uh, so for uh, my sister's children, for sure, uh, we're going we're gonna to go through the World Vision catalog together, actually. And uh, I'm going to let them pick what they'd like to contribute. Whether they want to give rabbits or goats exactly. or whatever. That's right. Okay. Exactly. When we come back, a controversial pastor who says under-consuming is just as dangerous as over-consuming after this. Joining me now in studio is Pastor Bruxy Cavey of The Meeting House, and this is the author of The End of Religion. He's also into marketing. Buy Nothing Day, quite provocative, and mm -hmm. it's shocking to me how it is growing in popularity. Mm -hmm. Started out of our little British Columbia, 65 yes, countries yes, now, and yes. protests everywhere. But you caution that under-consuming is just as sick a problem as <laughs> my over-consuming, sure. right? What I want to make sure is that we can use things like Buy Nothing Day and the Simplicity Movement um, to jolt us into wise living and not just turn simplicity into the new idol, um, but rather say, uh, so Buy Nothing Day can be a wonderful thing if it turns a light switch on that gets you to rethink your relationship with materialism. But then if buying nothing becomes the new standard or the person who's the poorest or the person who uh, who dresses the, the simplest is yeah, the shabbiest. The person who looks like they haven't tried to dress up the most is somehow more spiritual or more in control of their life or somehow uh, you know a person who has matured or advanced beyond the rest of us. I think it can become a kind of reverse idolatry that can come from that. So it is yeah. What's the right level? Yes, well, I think the question is always, uh, what is more important in our lives, product, ownership, or relationships? And product, ownership, ownership or, or relationships. relationships. We have to choose uh, I, I which think is the most important of those what's three. Most, once you know what's most important in your life, and then you consciously live by that, you have a, you have a filter that can allow you to make case-by-case -case choices on what you're going to buy or not buy, because the question becomes, does this purchase or this, uh, this particular event I'm going to spend my money on increase relationships or does it take away from relationships? And you would say relationships is the most important thing. I would argue there is an intuitive human wisdom that says relationship is the meaning of life. Who put that there? It, it, intuitive that's right. human Intuit I, I think we're made in the image of a relational God and that the, the force behind this universe is relationship, is love. The New Testament says God is love. And so that's a relational concept and I think we're made in the image of that love. We are wired for relationship. We can't help it. And if you ask people on their deathbed, what are their regrets or what are they what are they pleased about in life? Their regrets and the things that they're satisfied about as they look back over their life will revolve around what they did or didn't do with their relationships. Okay, but there are so many people who, whose relationships have gone down, down the tube and they can't do anything about it. Yes, like they, yes. and, and so you're saying pin it all on relationships, but they're saying there's nothing there. There's a starting place for all of us and that's God. I think that is our vertical relationship is a great beginning point because he's gracious, he's patient, he's a good place to start, and he's pouring out the love at all times if we just open up our eyes to so it. If all other relationships have tanked, that one is still there to be consumed. Yes, yes absolutely. Consumed he fills is actually us a great up. word for the, you know, us and God. Yes, yeah. and then he asks us to love him back 
by loving others who themselves perhaps are disconnected from relationship. So rather than trying to get that person to love you who is broken from you, to go and say, who, where can I volunteer my time? Who are those people who are disenfranchised? How can I go and show love to the unlovable according to our societal standards? Or can I consume a new category of relationships that might come to me through the faith world. Yes, that's right. When You know, there's a, a lot of people who consider themselves spiritual but not religious, and I'm sure many of them may be watching, who would say, I read these books and I'm not into religion, but I like being spiritual. I think that has advantages and it can be healthy, but it has a weakness that uh, there are many people who are out there who are alone trying to be spiritual, and they don't have spiritual communities. That is an advantage that a purely religious person has, is they have community. And so to find a spiritual community with people who are willing to investigate how our relationship with God and our relationships with others can become the center of our life, then we can make healthy relationships when it comes to what we buy or don't buy. Will it enhance or distract from our relationships? A lot of what we've discovered on the buy nothing experience mm -hmm. And, and about the why shopping or all kinds of, you know, the 10,000 villages feature we, we just did. Mm. It is about being a consumer that thinks for more people than just yourself. That's a yes. deeply spiritual theme, isn't yes. it? Isn't it neat to know that even shopping can be an act of love? That yeah. shopping can be an act of caring for people you haven't even met yet, but that you can, you can, you have the power to bless someone, to put a smile on their faith by making a simple purchase or not making other purchases. So we can be mindful. We can practice mindfulness, thoughtfulness as we as we relate to material things. If we if we see relationship as the core, then all of our activities can become relational in some way. We ask the question, how, how do my purchases and how does my relationship with money affect the relationships in my life and relationships with people I might not ever meet, but they're still important to me. Jesus has a line in a story he tells. He, he, uh, he tells a parable about a guy who um, uses money to make friends. And, and uh, the guy's a bit um, shifty, but Jesus says, if even he can, knows how to use money to make friends, he, he then turns it around to his listeners and says, you should use money to make friends. Now, when I was a kid, I thought that meant I should bribe people to be my friend. But I think Jesus' point is that we should take our money and invest it in relationships, turn money into relationship. Thank you very much, Bruxy. More on Bruxy Cavey, The Meeting House, and his new book, The End of Religion, on our website at listenuptv.com. Stay with us when we come back. The author of On Earth As It Is in Advertising joins us. Well, welcome back to Listen Up's look into the question of consumerism. And our next guest believes there is no force stronger in popular culture than advertising. He teaches how to think a different way about it from the PBS studios in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Sam Van Emmen, welcome. You've got a title on this book that has caught my attention on earth. It's, it's, a, it's a phrase, a rephrase mm -hmm. of that famous prayer that used to be said in schools across North America when this continent was a more Christian place. Mm -hmm. You've crossed the Lord's Prayer with your title on earth as it is in advertising. Tell me why you've done that. Uh, it's, it's our prayer. I mean, it's what we are voicing when we um, figure out what it means to live in our culture. Jesus said, pray this prayer, pray, um, may your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And that would require a certain vision that we might have. But it's much easier to simply pray, oh Lord, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just that as it was in that Target ad I saw last night, or in the Walmart ad, or in the Gap ad, or the Toyota ad, just as it is in advertising, because their life seems a little better than mine. Their life is more on, like on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, Sam, what are the basic human needs that you see advertising targeting? It's not about products for you. You see That's a right. need ethos going, right? That's right. And what are those basic human needs you see advertising targeting? There are two ads that are coming to mind right away. Uh, the first is a recent ad for Lunesta. It's a sleeping aid, a sleeping pill. And it opens with a woman tossing and turning on a bed. And she is asking questions in her mind. Her mind is racing about um, how will we pay the electrician bill and what will we do with our kids and who will watch the dogs. I don't know what all she asks, but it's a number of questions that are typical stresses in all of our lives. And this woman is wrestling, uh, and it's keeping her up at night. 
Now, I'm not saying that people don't need sleeping pills. Some, some folks do very much so. But, but uh, she's dealing with things that I would deal with or that you might deal with on a weekly basis. And so what happens is the sim gospel, this, this kind of um, this simulated message comes in and very much like the gospel says, we know what you need. What you want, what you desire is what God wants for you and that is peace or tranquility or it's relief from your pain. Um, the gospel says in a place like uh, Jeremiah 6, I, I was just reading this. In fact, the day I saw the Lunesta ad, I, saw, I read this passage in Jeremiah 6 that says, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Now that's interesting to me. That, that requires some hard work. It's not an easy answer. That night, I'm sitting there watching television and I see the Lunesta ad and I see the woman struggling with things, looking for rest for her soul. And then the answer, of course, the solution is sweep your problems under the bed at least for the next eight hours. You'll still have to pay the electrician in the morning, but okay. you can at least deal with it. So Sam, are you saying advertising steals its best pitches from the Bible? I think so because that that is, it has to in a way. Cornelius Plantinga says that um, sin is a, is a parasite. It borrows, it must borrow from the good. Because if we, were to, if we were created to need certain things, to desire certain things, to be fulfilled in only certain ways, then that's just the blueprint for who we are. And so if, if, if advertising can take those messages and pick up on them and say, you know what, we recognize what you need and offer a solution that's much easier to get usually than waiting for you know, God's timing and his more difficult answers sometimes, uh, then we've got a product to sell because we all need, we all need this basic fulfillment. So does the Lunesta ad, does the Lunesta, the sleeping pill, solve this woman's problems temporarily, but long-term, no, I don't think so. That's incredible. Like you're saying advertising is about, about a, a replacement for the salvation experience. In, in a way, I, I think we still, even as Christians, we'll still desire for what God wants for us. We still long for that, but we settle for something else. And I think that's where the prayer then is, is co-opted to say, may your will be done on earth as it is in advertising. So Sam, bottom line, when I'm watching a television commercial, I mm -hmm. should be aware that it could be sending spiritual messages that the product is trying to hijack. Yes, I think so. And I think it's our job um, to be thoughtful and to res responsible. Now, um, one of the things that I think about when I think about advertising is the, uh, the idea, the, the role of a prophet, not just Old Testament prophets, but people like Martin Luther King Jr., folks who play two roles in the culture. One is to look around discerningly and say, that's what's wrong, and they serve as a critic. And the second part is to say, but here's what you can look toward. Here's what will solve that deep longing, and so they serve as a visionary. The gospel does that over and over again. Here's what's wrong, here's a solution, and not in an easy, cliche way. Advertising does the same, way, the same thing. It, it says, um, here's what's wrong. We understand what you're struggling with, but here's a solution. And it so resonates with us that we buy into it. And it might not come in a shampoo bottle or whatever. Sam, fascinating yeah. book. We've got it up on our website, On Earth As It Is in Advertising by Sam Van Emmen. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Lorna. Have a, have a very thoughtful time watching television this week. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Well, they could call this a bestseller, but it's free. It's Our Daily Bread, one of North America's most popular spiritual resources for the questions that affect your lives. Available for you at keypromises.org. No cost or obligation. Order your copy today. On the trail of questioning consumerism, we've uncovered spiritual issues. We learn a lot about ourselves when we start rethinking our spending habits. It causes us to rethink our image. We've heard today that advertising's biggest sell is to dig into who we are and what we're worth. Marketing may exploit those questions, but they aren't the first source to put those thoughts in our mind. I'd say questions of self-worth are planted by God. So in rethinking the image issue that spending less may raise, 
it's a good time to ask just what was the image God intended for me to have? More on these thoughts at my blog. I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for joining us.